hi today we're going to be talking about um, some of those questions that people would walk in the funeral home and sit down to make arrangements and they would say well I heard this on the TV or I heard this from my friend or so-and-so's dad went to this funeral home and was buried and they were told this or I'm sure this is the case and just misinformation delivered by people that weren't very educated or there was misconceptions about um, what was said or maybe not the whole truth was told. So um, I've got a list of questions that people had submitted so I'm going to kind of just go through the questions. Um, the first one was asked if my kids prearrange or if I prearrange my funeral and I pay for it, uh, can my kids after I die come along and change my plans? So in Michigan, because as I've said before, we only really talk Michigan um, law for the most part here, but there's nothing in place to protect what you have put into your prearrangement that you want to be carried out. So essentially, your kids can come along, tell the funeral director, just go ahead and cremate her, even though she wanted to be buried, and there's nothing really in place to protect that. I know it doesn't seem logical, but there is nothing to protect that. Um, there is a rule that the funeral home does not have to return the excess funds to the family if they've... So, going back a little. So, what used to happen, um, mom would say, well, if I have to do a spend down for going into a nursing home, but I want my kids to have this money. I'm going to go to the funeral home. I'm going to give them $30,000. I'm going to put it in with them, and then when I die, the kids can just cash that in, and then they have their money. So all these laws have come into place over the years to protect kind of the government from not having access to those funds when the person goes in the nursing home. That They can essentially shelter that money at a funeral home and just hold on to it for the family. So there's a cap on how much can put it, be put in with a funeral home when you pre-fund. And then, um, but there's nothing legally put into place for your kids to come along and to choose a lesser service for you so that they can get some of that money. Now the only way that would be um, set is if you had that irrevocable, which means that money can't be touched if you needed to go on government assistance. So let's say you needed to, when you're in the nursing home, you needed to start getting state aid. You would have to lock that money in so that way the f government couldn't count that as an asset for you. So that really is the only way to make sure that your kids don't give you lesser services for them to get that money back. It may not be a situation your family has to ever worry about, but I've seen many of families that, yes, those kids would rather have money now that mom has died than give her the service that she had wanted. Um, so they're working on that ruling. It's been a long process. It's all about um, technicalities at this point with those laws getting pushed forward because right now um, a deceased body is not a deceased person. It's um, Once someone dies, they're kind of property, and so um, it, it's reworking that wording in all of the history of law to make it so that that can actually um, be put into place so that kids and or grandkids or whoever it is cannot change what you have written down. Um, in terms of the funeral home keeping that money, it, it's really frowned upon, obviously. What funeral home is going to, you know, it's going to make a worse name for the funeral home if they keep all that money than if that kid actually changes and, and doesn't, you know, say mom put in 10000 for a full burial and your kids come in and do a direct cremation for 2000 because they want that $8,000 back. Well, the funeral home can keep that $8,000, but then they look horrible, even though the kids are kind of the one who should look horrible for changing what their mom wanted but it is never going to spin out and play out that way um, on social media on anywhere. It's going to be the funeral home who looks bad. So funeral homes typically aren't going to do that. They're going to, you know, let, let karma take its course, so to speak. So this also brings up um, the next of kin legality. So 
um, Michigan just did a huge change on this, which is so exciting because it um, we had a lot of roadblocks meeting with families. So when someone dies, there is a legal next of kin order with who makes your funeral arrangements. And until just recently, who could authorize your cremation? Um, it went spouse, children, grandchildren, parents, grandparents, um, siblings, etc. And it was a majority. So uh, it would be, you know, if you had five kids and you had to get three of them to sign your cremation authorization in order for it to be allowed. So um, it was kind of, I, I, I think over the course of, you know, my 15 years being licensed, I had one family where we couldn't find um, the kids, the majority of the kids, to be able to sign the paperwork. We ended up having to bury the woman. Uh, because we couldn't find them, so they did make after that some rulings that if we had, if you kind of kept track of how you contacted and you made an earnest effort and really tried to find people, then you know you could kind of move on to the next in order. And I'm a finder. Um, I have I have found some people that were unfindable. So I uh, that was kind of my. Um, my claim to fame uh, is that I've been able to find some really hard people to get a hold of. So, but Michigan just recently put into play a, it's called a funeral representative declaration that you can fill out and you can pick anybody you want to make your funeral arrangements. So you can have your neighbor be in charge for you. You can have Joe Schmo, whoever, um, but you have to be of legal, um, sound mind, when doing this so you can't wait until you've been declared you know incompetent with dementia or anything like that you have to be do this when you have sound mind legally to sign that authorization over to whoever it is that way then your kids can't come in and take over um, whoever this person is that you designate can this also came um, to be pretty important with um, non-married couples and like I have one aunt which um, I'm going to kind of reference her situation because it's kind of the perfect one for this where I know she wants to be cremated she has two children so let's say those two children don't agree which I'm not saying that's the case but what if they don't agree so when there's only two you have to have both on the same page since they both have 50 percent right to say what is going to happen with her so if one of them didn't agree she can't be cremated she also has a partner that um, she's been with him for a very, very long time, and but he had no legal right to say what was going to happen to her after she died. Well, with this new ruling, her and him can go to the funeral home, get this form, fill it out, and have it in place. That way, when she dies, he just as if they were legally married, can make all of those arrangements for her and can sign the cremation authorization. So this was huge, especially with um, um, same-sex couples and, you know, these folks who maybe they didn't get married. Um, you know, we run into and we see a lot of where older couples don't get married even though they're in this longer term relationship because it'd be a second marriage for both of them but they don't want to lose social security benefits or some kind of benefit that they're getting if they got remarried but then when the time comes that person doesn't have any legal say in what's going to happen to them and so it's, it, it was always kind of a slippery slope but this new form which literally just recently came out has really helped um, so that kind of answers that side of it. Um, Tim had asked, how do I know my loved one is actually who comes back from the crematory? So I think here is given a little history of the cremation, kind of a little breakdown of what happens during cremation. So um, when someone arrives to the crematory, they are already typically in their um, either a casket that they're being cremated in or the cardboard box that has been designated for that cremation. By that point, if they had a pacemaker, the funeral home would have surgically removed the pacemaker and that's done because pacemakers explode inside of um, the retort, which is the cremation chamber, I guess is what you would say. Um, they explode and do 
serious damage to the equipment and to the crematory itself. Um, so that is removed typically before they get to the crematory. Once they're at the crematory, um, there's a lot of labeling done in terms of um, all the paperwork, um, the box, just in case they're, you know, they have to wait in, for the retort to become available again. And there's a metal chip that does not melt during the process that has a number or lettering or something imprinted on it that is essentially a case file number for that person. So that chip stays with that set of um, remains. So in the cremation, in the retort, once they're taken out, it's always with that cremated remains. So that way if um, down the road, I know I just read an article where somebody moved into a home and they were doing some remodeling and they, they found a box of cremated remains and they there was no name on them. So they found the chip inside, which typically has the crematory's name on it and then that number. And so they called the crematory trying to find records to try and find who this box of cremated remains was. It happens probably more than we think. Um, I think every funeral home has boxes, multiple boxes of cremated remains on a shelf somewhere that are unclaimed. No one ever comes back for the person. Um, we try to get them to connect it to a family member, but you know, I've been at a funeral home where they have hundreds of boxes of unclaimed cremated remains. And it's, it's sad, but it's just kind of the reality where somebody doesn't want burial, they don't have money for burial, they want to do cremation, but they don't want to take responsibility for those cremated remains, so they just leave them at the funeral home. Um, and that's just kind of, that's how it is. So at the, crema at the crematory, then the, um, the box is rolled into the retort, and the cremation takes about one to two hours. And it all depends on time of day, so if the retort has been running for several hours already, or if it's first thing in the morning, the interior temperature is obviously going to be different throughout the day, but it runs at about 1800 to 2000 degrees Fahrenheit. So it is super hot. Um, and so that's people always say, well, I don't want part of a cardboard box back. Well, during that process, it is so hot that it, everything is getting burned off. Everything is getting burned off and burned away except for that base part of the bones, the basic um, element structure of the, the bone system. And so um, when the cremation is done, uh, the remains are left to cool for a while before they're moved and then they're kind of swept and scooped out of the, the retort and there's huge hunks. It doesn't look like what is returned when the process is done. So all of that is pulled out and placed in a, a tray, and then a magnet is run over it. So staple, you know, surgical staples and implants and things like that are all removed. Uh, any large ones are taken out, and then that magnet will get small um, surgical pieces. Any soft metals, so any gold, things like that are all melted away and gone. There's nothing left of them at the end of the cremation process to be, be taken out. So that's why we, we often recommend that you know special jewelry is taken off the person and then placed back in with the cremated remains afterwards so that it's not destroyed. Because that way if you ever wanted it back, it's a possibility. Um, and then those cremated remains are then, those larger hunks of bone are put in this machine that essentially spins and shakes and breaks it down until you get that um, more pulverized, um, grittier, dustier substance, which is cremated remains that you get back. And then that tag is also in there with that person. So, um, you know, there's no way to 100% know uh, I can't 100% tell you it's always your person, except for the cremation places that I've, the crematories I've worked with. Because it's always places that I know, I trust, I would send my family member there if they wanted to be cremated, and so I think you have to know and trust who you're dealing with. That's why I think sometimes when you go to some of these pop-up um, low cremation places that have not been around for a long time, and, um, you know, do you trust them? Do you trust them? If you were paying them $10,000 to bury your mom, do you trust them with, you know, all other areas? And I think you have to ask yourself that question. 
rather than just their price tag fits the situation. Um, because you don't want to question at the end of the day, is my mom here? Is this my mom or is this my dad? And I don't think I ever had to answer that question until it was about 13, 14 years ago. I think that the Georgia incident happened where the crematory in Georgia, they found there was hundreds of bodies out behind the crematory in this swamp that they had either just thrown out there or um, haphazardly tried to bury, but they found remains from just hundreds of people and they had been returning, you know, dirt or kitty litter or whatever to funeral homes, to places, to families. Um, in place of the loved ones because their retort had stopped working, um, because they just couldn't uh, run the facility, and so they were just scamming for a long time. Um, it was a horrible situation, and it made people that encountered any funeral home really leery about them getting back their loved one. And that's happened at a couple other crematories um, that we've heard and has been on the news, but it's just like the bad funeral homes. They're any industry there's going to be bad places um, so it's just knowing and trusting and getting your information um, so a, a big question we always get is I'm a veteran you're gonna bury me for free right the TV tells me that I'm a veteran so I get a free burial correct well no <laughs> um, and I hate saying that it's always you always feel like you're insulting someone when you tell them no you're wrong um, National cemeteries, so around in my area, the National Cemetery is Fort Custer over in Augusta near Battle Creek, and it is gorgeous. Um, it's one of my favorite cemeteries to go to, my favorite um, spaces to be part of a service at because of the reverence and how just how gorgeous. It's all flat, um, a lot of history there of the old well, the old Fort Custer that used to be there, there's a huge grouping of German soldiers that are buried there. And they're the section that have the upright headstones. The rest of the cemetery is all flat stones. But those soldiers were all, um, they were POWs and they all died in a vehicle accident um, together when they were being held over here. And so they're all buried here. A few of them have been moved back to their family. Um, in Germany but they're all here and I think that's just such a cool piece of history that is at the cemetery and I know every cemetery is going to have cool history but just a little bit tidbit about there um, so at a national cemetery and there's just a few other small ones in Michigan um, that is our closest most local one uh, veterans are given a grave space a vault the setting and ceiling of that vault and a headstone at no cost. Their spouse is also given that same benefit and then any dependent children. So under 18 or if you had a handicapped child that maybe was living with you later into their life, they would also qualify. Um, currently, the husband and wives are being buried one on top of the other. So a um, long, deep vault is placed in. Whoever dies first is placed on the bottom. A divider is then put in between. So then when the second spouse dies, they would open that grave, place the next vault in, and then place the, the lid on. Um, so they are together. It saves ground space, um, which is important so that they don't run out of room there, um, hopefully for a long time. And um, I think that's kind of a cool that they get to be right on you know, right on top of each other. Uh, so those items are allocated towards it, which it can be a huge cost because just purchasing the grave and the opening and closing alone, and as I've said before, can be upwards to three, four thousand dollars for those items combined. You know, vaults can run um, up to three, four thousand dollars as well. So it can be a huge savings in the cost of the burial, but you also still have the funeral home costs and the services and the casket and any other merchandise and then cash advance items. So the obituary and the pastor and, and all of that. So you still have um, a large portion that does need to be um, expensed for. Um, now some folks 
also question, well, aren't, isn't there government money that goes towards my funeral then if I'm a veteran? There's not really. Um, so there's a county benefit. Each county has typically about a $300 benefit that can be applied for, and each county sets its own um, set of uh, rules as to why you would be allowed to get it. A lot of times it's financially based. Um, some of it is you had to serve during wartime. So there's a lot of different um, uh, limitations to them. Uh, then there's some federal benefits which sometimes will pay for a grave space if you're outside of the National Cemetery, sometimes transportation costs. Uh, that is only for a disabled veteran or if it was a career veteran. So sometimes disabled uh, isn't so much that you had a disability you were receiving for throughout your life, but maybe later on your death was, uh, they deemed that your death was maybe related to your service time. So maybe Agent Orange or you were got lung cancer because you worked with asbestos when you were in the service and so it's connected back to it and then it is a service related death and so there's things that you can apply for um, later but it's still not going to cover probably a majority of the funeral costs I would say. Um, you are always entitled if you're a veteran to two um, gentlemen or ladies from your um, so if you're in the armies, they'll send to army. If you're in the Marines, to Marines, um, etc. for your burial detail. So they will come, they will fold and present the flag and play taps. You are not always going to get a firing squad. That's usually a local, if we can get a VFW uh, group or a American Legion group to come in to do that, then you would be able to have the firing squad. Um, there's a presidential certificate that comes, and oh, I haven't seen a new one with uh, Trump's signature on it yet, though, so I'm going to have to check that out. I've been seeing Barack ones for so long that I forgot we will have to keep an eye out for new uh, Trump ones. Um, you do get a flag for that burial, one flag, so the funeral home can only request and get one flag. Some situations, there's a spouse and there's parents living, and if you let the military detail know that sometimes they can bring an extra one if you if the family's like well we want two well the funeral home can only get one we have one form we take it to the post office they give us a flag and that's it so we can't get more than one at the funeral home for those type of burials and um, then we there's a marker a headstone for a veteran that we can get as well there's a couple different styles so you would work with the funeral home they can give you the form you can print it yourself if you're not working with the funeral home to get that but you do have to pay for it to be installed um, the markers free installation you do have to pay for and then some funeral homes will give um, extras to a veteran maybe they'll give you the flag case or some veterans themed bookmarks or, or things of, of that nature so there are some funeral homes who go above and beyond and, and do give you know veteran discounts or, or things like that so there's some different things that um, funeral homes do offer for veterans things you do have to have your DD 214 which is your discharge there has to be some documentation that you were active duty, honorably discharged, and that um, they can use to apply. If you don't have that, most funeral homes can try to